Welcome back to our course, Fundamentals of Operating Systems, based on the textbook Operating System Concepts, 10th edition, by Silbershots, Gagney, and Galvin, published by Wiley Publishing. In the last lesson, we began an investigation of input-output systems. This is lesson two of that unit, and this lesson should complete that unit. So let's get started. The complete protocol for interaction between a host and a controller can be intricate, but the basic handshaking notion is simple. Assume that two bits are used to coordinate the producer-consumer relationship between the controller and the host. The controller indicates its state through the busy bit in the status register that we just discussed in the last lesson. Remember that to set a bit means to write a 1 into the bit, and to clear a bit means to set it to 0. The controller sets the busy bit when it is busy working and clears the busy bit when it is ready to accept the next command. The host signals its wishes via the command ready bit in the command register. The host sets the command ready bit when a command is available for the controller to execute. For this example, the host writes output through a port, coordinating with the controller by handshaking as follows. First, the host repeatedly reads the busy bit until that bit becomes clear. Then the host sets the write bit in the command register and writes a byte into the data out register. The host again sets the command ready bit. Now the controller notices that the command ready bit is set. It sets the busy bit. And the controller reads the command register and sees that write command. It reads the data out register to get the byte and does the input output to the device. The controller then clears the command ready bit, clears the error bit in the status register to indicate that the device I.O. has succeeded, and clears the busy bit to indicate that it is finished. This loop is repeated for each byte. In step one, the host is busy waiting or polling. It is in a loop reading the status register over and over until the busy bit becomes clear. If the controller and device are fast, this method is okay. But if the wait may be long, the host should probably switch to another task. In that case, how does the host know when the controller becomes idle? For some devices, the host must service the device quickly or data will be lost. For example, when data are streaming in on a serial port or from a keyboard, the small buffer on the controller will overflow and data will be lost if the host waits too long before returning to the read the bytes. Before returning to read the bytes. In many computer architectures, three CPU instruction cycles are sufficient to poll a device, read a device, and to extract a status bit, and branch if not zero. Clearly the basic polling operation is sufficient, but polling becomes inefficient when it's attempted repeatedly but rarely finds a device ready for service. While all this polling is going on, useful CPU processing remains undone. In such cases, it may be more efficient to arrange for the hardware controller to notify the CPU when the device becomes ready for service, rather than to require that the CPU poll repeatedly for an input-output completion. All this sounds familiar, doesn't it? We've talked about interrupts in the past and we're about to do it again. The hardware mechanism that enables a device to notify the CPU is called an interrupt. 
The basic interrupt mechanism works as follows. The CPU hardware has a wire called the interrupt request line that the CPU senses after every instruction. When the CPU detects that a controller has asserted a signal on the interrupt request line, the CPU performs a state save and jumps to the interrupt handler routine at a fixed address in memory. The interrupt handler determines the cause of the interrupt, performs the necessary processing, performs a state restore, and executes a return from interrupt instruction to return the CPU to the execution state prior to that interrupt. We say that a device controller raises an interrupt by asserting a signal on the interrupt request line. The CPU catches an interrupt and dispatches it to the interrupt handler, and the handler clears the interrupt by servicing the device. This figure on the right shows an interrupt-driven input-output cycle. Even single-user modern systems manage hundreds of interrupts per second, and servers hundreds of thousands per second. The basic interrupts mechanism just described enables the CPU to respond to an asynchronous event as when a device controller becomes ready for service. In modern operating systems, however, we need more sophisticated interrupt handling procedures. We need the ability to defer interrupt handling during critical processes. We need an efficient way to dispatch to the proper interrupt handler for a device without first polling all devices to see which one raised the interrupt. We also need multi-level interrupts so that the operating system can distinguish between high and low priority interrupts and can respond with appropriate degree of urgency when there are multiple concurrent interrupts. And finally, we need a way for an instruction to get the operating system's attention directly for activities such as page faults, errors such as division by zero, and so on. In modern hardware, these features are provided by the CPU and by the interrupt controller hardware. Most CPUs have two different interrupt request lines. One is the unmaskable interrupt, which is used for events such as an unrecoverable memory error. The second interrupt line is maskable. It can be turned off by the CPU before the execution of instruction sequences that are not to be interrupted. The maskable interrupt is used by device controllers to request service. The interrupt mechanism accepts an address. This is a number that selects a specific interrupt handling routine from a small set. In most architectures, this address is an offset in a table called an interrupt vector. The vector contains a, the memory addresses of specialized interrupt handlers. The purpose of a vectored interrupt mechanism is to reduce the need for a single interrupt handler to search all possible sources of interrupt to determine which one needs service. You remember my story about sending the large output to a printer back in the days of the Apple II? I lost control of the computer while the CPU was busy transferring that document to a slow printer. For a device that does large transfer, such as a disk drive, it seems wasteful to use an expensive general purpose processor to watch status bits to feed data into a controller register one byte at a time, a process, by the way, termed programmed input-output. Computers avoid burdening the main CPU with programmed input-output by offloading some of this work to a special purpose processor called a direct memory address controller. Now we've talked about that several times. To initiate a direct memory address transfer, 
the host writes a DMA command block into memory. This block contains a pointer to the source of a transfer, a pointer to the destination of a transfer, and a count of the number of bytes to be transferred. The command block can be more complex, including a list of sources and destination addresses that are not contiguous. The CPU writes the address of this command block to the DMA controller, then goes to work on something else. In other words, back in that day, I could have gone back to work instead of waiting on the printer. The DMA controller proceeds to operate the memory bus directly, placing addresses on the bus to perform transfers without the help of the main CPU. When the entire transfer is finished, the DMA controller interrupts the CPU. A simple DMA controller is standard on all modern computers from smartphones to mainframes. Well, I believe that will conclude our examination of input-output systems. Go back and review your notes, update your study guide, and when you are ready, we will move on to the next unit, which I believe is the file system manager.